So we have the kids with us this morning. So let me, let me just ask a question to the kids uh, while you're here. Have you ever been asked to clean your room? Anybody? We got some big kids laughing. I, I'm listening for the little kids. They're, they're, they're not laughing. They're not sure where I'm going with this. Uh, so to the kids, have you been, ever been asked to pick up your toys? So then mom or dad, grandma, grandma, whoever, they ask you to clean up your room. They ask you to pick up your toys. Now you have the choice. Do I clean my room? Do I pick up the toys? Or do I continue to play? Or do I go outside and leave it for later? So let's just say you choose not to pick up the toys or you choose to not clean up your room, who gets to make the next choice? Right? Mom and dad. Because you did not clean up your room or because you didn't pick up your toys, then whatever. I don't know what your mom and dad would say to you. So we get to choose our actions. We don't always get to choose the consequence for our actions. And that's what we're going to see this morning from Genesis uh, chapter 3. Um, when we see, uh, what we're going to see this morning is that when we choose to sin against God, and all sin is against God, uh, we might get to choose that sin, but we don't get to choose what the consequence will be. And Adam and Eve found this out the hard way. My guess is that every one of us has experienced that uh, on some level in our lives. So let's, let's, um, let's read this passage together. We'll pray, and, uh, and then we'll look at it together. So we'll start Genesis chapter 3. A couple verses we read last, we, we read uh, maybe through verse 7 last week. So let's start in verse 6 this morning. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Now, we know from last week this was the sin. God had told them you may not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and yet uh, here's Adam and Eve. They look at it. It looks good. Uh, it's probably going to taste good, and it it, their, their hope was it would make them wise. So they took it and they ate of it. Eve ate of it, Adam ate of it. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, this is Adam responding, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, he's the one that deceived me. And I ate. Heavenly Father, uh, help us to see this morning that uh, we have all taken from that tree and that we have all eaten. Uh, that sin uh, is something that we all uh, have dealt with. Uh, sin is something that we all have committed, that we are all equal in this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would see that this morning and we would see uh, how it ha has affected us, how it does affect us, it will continue to affect us. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So we talked about this um, last week, that the serpent came to Adam and Eve and really just, first of all, it kind of questioned God. Did God really say that you, and uh, so as, as he kind of throws this question uh, out about whether, what, God, what did God really do or not do, then the serpent really went straight out and contradicted what God said. God had told them not to eat, and the serpent said, or God told them that if they, not to eat it, if they ate it, they would die. The serpent said, you won't die if you eat it. God's withholding from you. He doesn't want you to be like him. 
And of course, we read this morning where Adam and Eve, they took from the fruit, they disobeyed God, and they ate from it. So a word that's not used in this passage, but is, is all in this passage, is the word sin. Uh, and and it's, it's not used in this chapter, but uh, what this chapter is describing is sin against God, the very first sin against God. So let's, let's try to define what sin is before we um, look at this chapter. Uh, you could say, we could say that sin is disobedience towards the laws or commands of God. 1 John 3 verse 4 says that sin is lawlessness, or sin is when you break the law. You have an instruction and you either ignore it or intentionally contradict it and, and go against it. So um, instead of following God's laws and, de- and decrees, you decide, I am not going to follow them. I will not do what God tells me to do. I will do what I want to do and said. Instead, So in the garden, God had one command for them. Don't eat from this tree. Wouldn't that be nice? One rule. All of life, one rule. And yet, even with one rule, Adam and Eve ate the fruit. But it's more than just uh, doing what you're not supposed to do. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount, talks about our, our thoughts and our attitudes. Uh, Jesus said it's not just adultery. Um, If you are in a relationship outside of marriage, but if you were to even lust after a woman, uh, Jesus said to the men, you're committing adultery. So it's not just what we do, but it's our our how we think and what our attitude uh, is like. Uh, Another way that sin is defined is missing the mark, which again would be an accurate uh, definition. So this is an archery term, and uh, it means to miss the target. So this is interesting because an archer is actually, he pulls the, puts the, the arrow in the bow and pulls back, and I, I'm not a hunter. You can probably tell by my form I'm not a hunter. But he's actually aiming at something, but misses. So this would indicate to us that even when we intend to do well and don't, we could be sinning. Uh, and, and you have to think about it, if, if you're in an archery a competition, or if you're out hunting in the woods, it doesn't matter how good your equipment is, how many practice shots you've taken, um, how good your form is, what counts is, did you hit the deer, or did you hit the bullseye, or did you miss it? And so sin is when we miss the mark. And Paul in Romans 3, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we use this term, fall short, usually means we are attempting something, we just didn't quite make it. And so uh, sin could be deliberately disobe- disobeying a command from God. It could be thought, our thoughts and our actions. It could be with good intentions. Expression goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Good intentions, but we don't actually quite do what we're supposed to do. Wayne Gruden said this, sin is any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. I think we'll see that here in the, in the passage. So a couple of weeks ago, we emphasized that, um, that, that the serpent was saying to Eve, God doesn't want you to eat that fruit because he is withholding from you. You can't trust God. He doesn't want you to have everything good. He's keeping some from you, and so you have to take matters into your own hands. Following God won't make you happy, and maybe today we would say following your heart would make you happy. And the serpent in verse 5, we didn't read it this morning, we read it last week, but makes this statement, if you eat of it, God knows that you will be like God. And I think it's really interesting because um, Adam, I think Adam and Eve took that to mean something, we'll be like him, we'll have his wisdom, and yet when they took that fruit and they ate from it, they were like him in a different way. When we sin, we are playing the role of God in our world. Think about this, God is the creator, he's the sovereign rule of the sovereign ruler of the world. He created order, and his, his word teaches us what that order is, and it is for our very best if we live according to the order that God has laid out for us in his word. 
So when we sin, we take on that role as sovereign ruler. And we say, we're going to create a new order. I'm going to determine what's right for me, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to determine what is right and what is wrong, and I will live my life the way that will, I think will be best for me. I'm going to be in control, and I'm going to make the rules. Sin is saying, let my will be done instead of let thy will be done. I'm going to do it my way. And we've all acted in that way before. Tim Keller says this, sin is acting in a self-centered way instead of a God-centered way. And so the temptation that the serpent offered to Adam and Eve is, you don't have to follow God's rules. You can decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. You think relativism is a new thing. It's right here in the Garden of Eden. The, the serpent's saying, you can decide. Eat this fruit, you'll be like God. You can decide the rules for your own life. You can determine what is good, what is bad. Don't let God determine what is good for you. It's essentially is what the serpent was offering to Adam and Eve. And it's the same for us today. Do what's right for yourself. Do what will make you happy. Now, we open God's word, and we recognize there's life-giving truth in here. Do you guys agree with me that's, with that this morning? There's life-giving truth in God's word, and yet we still find ourselves, if we're honest, breaking God's laws, self-centered attitudes, falling short of the glory of God. So sin is easy to see when it hurts somebody, very easy to see when it affects you, when somebody else's sin affects you, very easy to see. A little more difficult to see when your sin affects somebody else. But do we realize that even on our very best days, we still fall short of the glory of God? Like we're excited right now because of the ministry of Canal Lake Bible Camp. And I'll tell you, we had a, a, a great week. I say we, I feel like I'm still a part. I just come, kind of come down, wander around, mingle, see what's going on. Peter, do you need anything? Bo, do you need anything? And so it's a different role for me these days. Um, but I love to see you guys coming in and serving. And I see joy. I see uh, a willingness to do whatever needs to be done. I see um, uh, a, a willingness to do the difficult things. Just whatever needs to be done, I'm willing to do it. We want the kids to hear how much God loves them. We want the, the, the kids to hear the truth of God's word. And we just have uh, an amazing team of counselors and volunteers that come in to make that happen. But even in, in, in completing a great service to God, we could miss the mark. If you get up in the morning and out of obligation came to church this morning and taught Sunday school, oh, it's Sunday, I've got, a, I got my class this morning. Now maybe you get to Sunday school and you have a great time and the Lord redeems that, that attitude of obligation. That, that's missing the mark. You were obedient, you came, you did, so your actions were right but your attitude wasn't quite there. Uh, maybe you, you, you come and you serve, uh, you help the, the little old lady across the street, you take a meal to the neighbor, and you're just waiting for those words. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without you. It, people like you just brighten my day. Now, don't get me wrong, we do need to encourage one another, we do need to do things even when we don't feel like, we need to do the right thing even when we don't feel like doing it, but in a sense, even uh, someone completing their good Christian duty can fall short of God's glory because we are imperfect. Now, I'm emphasizing this, not to put a downer on whether, you know, you're coming to serve this week and you're thinking, oh boy, should I even come because I've kind of been doubting and I'm making the point that all have sinned. It's easy to look at someone in jail or in prison and say, they have sinned. But we need to sit here this morning and say, I have sinned. When we sing about our living hope, Jesus Christ, our living hope, boy, those words take on a whole new depth of meaning if we get up in the morning and say, Lord, I am a sinner. Thank you for being my savior. If anything good's gonna come out of my life today, it's gonna be because of you. 
No one is exempt from the reality of sin. In 1961, they were having, um, uh, I don't know the name of the, they they were having trials, uh, different ones uh, who had been part of the uh, uh, German and Nazi party and the army were, were on trial. So in 1961, the trial of Adolf Eichmann, he's a lieutenant colonel, SS officer, uh, they say he was one of the masterminds between the Holocaust, um, the Holocaust and, the, and the death camps. And so he was on trial, and Yehiel Deneur was a Jewish man. He had been a prisoner in, in a, in a um, detention camp in one of the death camps, and he was there to testify. During the trial, he was overcome with emotion, and he collapsed. They had to carry him out. He didn't finish his, his testimony. So 22 years later, this man, Yehel Diner, who had collapsed during the trial, was being interviewed by Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes. And so they showed a a clip of the trial and, and him collapsing and being carried out. And Mike Wallace said to him, what caused you to collapse? Did, you know, did you see this man and was, was there fear? Did you see this man uh, and was there, was there hate and rage within you? And this is what uh, Yehiel responded. He said, I saw that he was not a demon. He wasn't a superman, but he was an ordinary man like me. If he was capable of that, then I am capable of that too. And so I want us to understand this morning that all have sinned. I'm looking at a great group of people, and yet we are all sinners before God. And when we understand the depth of our depravity, we better understand the riches of God's grace. All right, look at verse 7 with me. Here's, here we see the result of sin. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Their eyes were open. They were hoping to become wise, and what they became wise to was evil, was sin. They, knew, they did not know this before. They had moved from God-centered thinking to self-centered. I'm going to get this because I think it will be good for me. I don't care what God has to say will be good for me. And they acted like God in that moment. And so when they took that fruit and they ate it, this is what their actions said. And this is what our actions say when we sin against God. I know what God instructed us to do, but I think it would be better if I do what I want instead of what God wants. This is what Adam and Eve, their actions said. This is what our actions say when we sin against God. And so we see right away that the relationship with God is broken. They were ashamed. They realized they were naked, and so they tried to hide. One with fig leaves, and then they hid in the bushes when, when Jesus uh, or God came to walk with them in the garden. Their innocence was lost. They tried to hide from God. The, the, they were afraid of God, it even says. They were afraid. This is the, 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 the God, the creator who made the garden for them, who came and walked with them in the garden. And all of a sudden, they were afraid of God. They withdrew from God. They tried to hide from God. The relationship with God was broken, not because of what God did. It's because of what Adam and Eve did. Verse 8 says this, When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the, cool, in the garden in the cool of the day, The man and the wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. They were afraid. I think I've mentioned this before, but when I read this, I always think of of playing hide-and-seek with a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And it's the two-year-old's turn to go hide, and so they, they go out into the middle of the living room, and they cover their eyes, and they just stand there. Or maybe they hunch down on their hands and knees with their eyes covered. The three-year-old's not much better. The three-year-old's right beside the two-year-old. They just kind of halfway threw a blanket over themselves. And they think that they are hidden from us. Well, this is Adam and Eve in the garden. How are they going to hide from God? And, and, and so we, we look at it, and uh, we think, you know, this is foolish. You can't. 
What are they, what are they thinking? There's an immediate breach in the relationship. But God went to them. It says in verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, the Lord God, God went to them in the the cool of the day, like he maybe perhaps he did on a regular basis, and Adam and Eve weren't there as they normally would, and so he called to them, where are you? So when when I read this passage, you know, I've been talking a little bit in the ways we're just like Adam and Eve. But in one way, I think that we're a lot different than Adam and Eve in this passage. We look at ourselves, and particularly if we look at our culture, we're very comfortable with sin. Adam and Eve knew that they had done wrong, and they were ashamed, they were afraid, and they hid from God. My fear is that our consciences aren't so tender. We sin and we think it's okay. Worse yet, we sin, we know that God knows about it, and that's okay as long as our family and our friends don't know about it. Perhaps because we know the scriptures and we're confident in the forgiveness that's available through the cross, and that's a wonderful, amazing truth. But our our sin should grieve us. Uh, Our sin shouldn't cause us to run and hide from God, but to go to him in confession. Thankful that he does forgive. So they're afraid, they're ashamed, they hid from God. And if we jump down a little bit later in the chapter, verses 22 through 24, ultimately this separation from God becomes permanent. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. They were afraid, they were ashamed, they hid, and they were, they were separated from God. They couldn't eat from that tree of life and continue a relationship with God in the same way forever. God said to them, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die, and God was true to his word. So not only is the relationship, though, broken with God, Many times when we sin, our relationship with each other is broken. We see the blame game that Adam and Eve played. Who told you that you were naked, God said? Did you eat from the the tree that I told you not to eat from? And what did Adam say? I just picture Eve, probably maybe with her head down, repentant, just thinking, Why'd we do that? We shouldn't have done that. Maybe even think, maybe forming an apology in her mind. And then here's Adam. It was her, God. And even worse, Adam said, it was you, God. You gave me the woman. This is your fault, God, just as much as it is mine. It's really her fault. It's your God... It's it's your fault, it's her fault. I only got a third of the responsibility, God. They all know what happened. And so we laugh. I laugh when I read it. I shake my head. And then I think about myself. I've just been so busy. Oh, it's just not a priority for me right now. If you heard the tone of their voice, you would have responded the same way. If they weren't so critical, I wouldn't have to be so defensive. If you knew the position that I was in, you might have done worse than me. My my hand was forced. I didn't have a choice. It's just a little thing. Everyone else is doing the same thing. We play the blame game ourselves, don't we? And we're pretty good at it. 
We love to excuse our disobedience. We love to excuse our wrong thinking and our bad attitudes. It's not our fault. We, we play the role of Adam. It's not my fault. Can you see how destructive, though, it would have been toward, uh, for Adam and Eve's relationship? I don't know what Eve was really thinking, but I've had someone point their finger at me before and say, this is your fault. And, and it's destructive for their relationship. wonder how the conversation went when they got home that day. <laughs> we've all been wrongly accused. We've all been wrongly blamed for something. We've probably all wrongly accused and blamed somebody else for something. And this goes all the way back to the garden. Relationships aren't necessarily broken in the sense like severed, but they are damaged when we sin. You, you can't just ever say, well, this sin is just between me and God. No, it affects people around you. There's also something really interesting uh, just a little bit later in the chapter. One of the results of sin in the world is marital tension between husbands and wives. Like this is straight from Genesis chapter three. And I think I gave the wrong verse to uh, the guys at the back. But Genesis chapter three, verse 16, God talking to Eve says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Sin works against the beauty that's supposed to be in marriage. Uh, we, we talked a little bit a few weeks ago um, of, of uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and this, this beautiful picture of how Christ is to love the church, how Christ gave, gave of himself for the church, how Christ loves the church, how he nourishes the church, how he cherishes the church, as he presents the church blameless before God. And the church in response submits to, uh, to their, to the church sub submits to Christ, their, their loving and caring and compassionate Savior who serves them selflessly. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus in the church. And then Paul says, this is why the marriage relationship is the way that it is. The marriage relationship is supposed to reflect the relationship between Christ and the church here on earth. And so one of the results of sin is that this relationship is skewed. In Genesis chapter 3, to Eve, your desire shall be contra contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. A, a wife contradict, living contradictory to her husband and a, ru and a husband ruling and being domineering to his wife is a result of the fall. So conflict in marriage is one of the results, not conflict. Conflict can just be, take that back. Conflict can just be because you see something differently. But this tension in marriage can, is, is directly related to the fall. So I said this a minute ago, that Adam and Eve's actions essentially said, I know what God has instructed me to do, but I think it would be better if I did what I wanted to do instead of what God wants me to do. I wonder what our response would be if we were honest with ourselves in that way when we were tempted to sin or about to sin. Like what if, what, what if, if Sarah and I are just having a, a healthy conversation Sometimes when we do that, we remind ourselves that we're in a spiritual battle. But what if, what if I said to myself, I know God's word tells me that I should love Sarah, but I am going to speak harshly to her because I'm going to do what I want to do instead of what God tells me will be good, even though I know it'll be detrimental to my relationship with God and my relationship with Sarah. Sarah. Would we ever speak to ourselves that way? If we did, I'd probably stop and say, 
That sounds like a terrible idea. I need to speak lovingly to Sarah and not harshly to her. We're all aware that we live in a broken world. There's much hate, there's much evil, wrongdoing, wrong thinking. But my prayer this morning is that we would realize that we are contributors to that. As, as Christ followers, we are called to be a city on a hill. We are called to be the salt of the earth. We are called to be a light in a dark place. We are all those things by the grace of God alone. So in the sense that we are, by God's grace, a light, we are his ambassadors, we are his representatives. We've received God's mercy and his grace for salvation. We're distinct and we're set apart. And yet, in another sense, it's not really us versus them. We all have sinned. We too put Christ on the cross. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Apostle Paul wrote, but for the grace of God, I am what I am. It's, it's easy to look at Adam and Eve here in chapter 3 of Genesis and see their foolishness. Maybe even think, man, if I could have just been there, I would have told them not to do it. I would have told them it's not worth it. In reality, when we sin... We're behaving just as foolishly as Adam and Eve. And in fact, we have other people around us that at times are saying, don't do it. It won't be worth it. And yet we do it anyways. Sin is rebellion against God, and it's just as foolish today as it was for Adam and Eve in the garden. I said uh, a minute ago, God did not leave Adam and Eve without hope, and he's not left us without hope either. In, in, uh, in verse 9, the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? Adam and Eve had sinned. They were ashamed. They were afraid. They were hiding. They were withdrawn from God, and God went to them. And in our sin today, God comes to us through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the hope of the gospel. That's what we shared with the kids last week. That's what we'll share with the kids again this week. You know the song the choir sings, He Came Looking for Me. I, I, sometimes when, I, when they sing that, I wonder if they were thinking about this passage when they wrote it. God went looking for Adam and Eve with a plan of redemption because of their sin. And God comes looking for us today, and he has a plan of redemption through Jesus Christ for each one of us. So part of me is quite glad that this, we're, we're talking about sin, and I hope that you're really thinking about yourself. Part of me wishes we had another 45 minutes to go right into the redemption that God provides, but we're going to leave it here and talk about God's redemption. We're in the series of origins, the origins of God, um, of this world, of man, of sin, and, and the last one we want to talk about is redemption. And we see redemption here in Genesis chapter 3. We see the beginning of it, and of course that is the story of the Bible. Man is sinful separated from God, but God has a plan to redeem mankind. And so I'm looking forward uh, to the next couple of messages as we get into that. For now, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that within your word, uh, we see the reality of who we are. And Lord, I pray that this morning... Uh, we see this on a personal level, Lord, that, that we would uh, recognize that we are sinful creatures and that you are a holy God. God, I hope that as we see that, uh, it stirs up a couple of things within us. One, I pray that it would uh, cause us to recognize our need for you, our, our, our need to put our faith and trust in Jesus' work on the cross. He, he came. He lived a perfect life. He didn't sin. 
And he said, I'll pay for the sin of all mankind. And he did that through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When we, we put our faith and trust in this, we are given new life. Lord, we're so thankful for that this morning. But I pray that we would recognize our need for you. Not just for salvation, but our need for you as we get up each day. That we would say, Lord, I need you today. Apart from you, I can do nothing. Help me to do the things that you have for me to do today. That even as Christians, even as representatives and ambassadors of God, that we would recognize, Lord, our need for you every single day. Lord, we confess uh, that we have sinned and we're thankful for the forgiveness that you give us. Let's pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take communion together this morning. If you did not get a communion cup, please uh, put your hand up and we'll make sure uh, that you got. There's a couple over here, guys, and uh, here in the, a couple in the middle here. Just as we are the same as Adam and Eve in that we have sinned, there's a consequence for our sin, and we too are separated from God because of our sin. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4 says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, made us alive together with Christ by grace you have been saved. We are made alive when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. One of the things Jesus said to his disciples is that he told them he was leaving. He told them that he was going to the cross and he told them to take bread and to take wine and to remember what he had done for them. And so the bread this morning represents Jesus' body and the suffering that he endured on our behalf. And the, the juice that we have represents his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, then the sin that we've been talking about is forgiven. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his willingness to go to the cross for us. Thank you that we can confess our sins and you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins. God, we're just going to pause for a moment so that individually we can reflect and we can confess sin that's in our life right now. Father, we recognize our need for you this morning. We're thankful that despite of our sin, you loved us. You sent your son for us. And we have hope of eternal life with you, not because of the good that we can do, but because of Jesus' work on the cross. I pray this in his name. Amen. Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As so often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Why don't you stand with me? We'll close this morning with the Lord's Prayer. God, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, in, a, in a few minutes, we'll get a few guys to help set up tables for the memorial meal uh, this afternoon. There's some prayer bracelets that you can grab on your way out. We're going to stop at 5.30 t tonight, wherever you are, to pray for the camp. And uh, the Sailors family will be receiving guests between 11.30 and 12.30. We'll start the service for Wayne at 12.30. Bye.